All right, so hi guys, welcome back to the Marine Bio Movie Club. We are so happy that you're joining us for our second episode today. We are going to be discussing Blackfish, which is something that especially Kendra, but myself have a little bit of a history with. And we thought this would be a great second episode because it really was such a hot topic documentary at the time. Uh, if you're new here and you don't know who we are, my name is Taylor. I am a marine biologist, a dive master, shark diver, researcher, um, free diver, lots of different things. We also have Kendra. Do you want to introduce yourself, Kendra? Hello, I am Kendra. I am a marine biologist as well, and I work with PNW Protectors, which is a NGO conservation here in the Salish Sea. And we work with Southern Resident Killer Whale Conservation via ecosystem restoration. Yeah, so Kendra very specifically and for a long time has worked with in the kind of like orca, killer whale, cetacean sphere. That's kind of her specialty. Whereas I definitely focus more into the shark and the elasma brink aspect of marine science. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to add some perspective. Uh, we both have a long history with SeaWorld. I don't know if Kendra, you wanna kind of go into just like your relationship with the park just in general. So I started going to SeaWorld when I was nine months old um, in SeaWorld San Antonio, because I'm from Texas originally. And we always sent, until I think I was like 14, we had season or annual passes to SeaWorld. And from when I was little there, we have scrapbooks because you know, moms used to scrapbook. And in them, there's like so many notes of like SeaWorld trip 1999 or SeaWorld trip 2001. Kendra would not leave Shamu Stadium. We had to see every single killer whale show. And like my parents don't like watching just one show all day. And so, but I would, even from when I was little sitting there just wanting to see the killer whales, every killer whale show we had to go to, we would do the behind the scenes stuff. And it was like, Kendra just wanted the orcas. Um, then we moved from San Antonio to Arizona and then San Diego kind of became the home park and we still would go every almost every year. And in 2007, I think I actually was in the show and I was in Believe, which is the best SeaWorld show. Yeah, I definitely I I agree. on that hill <laughs> and I got to feed and pet Corky and it was awesome. They basically just like when you're walking in the stadium, they kind of just will randomly ask a kid and their parent like, hey, do you want to be in the show? Um, so I thank my sister because she had asked us to go get her cotton candy. We were already sitting and got up and left. So if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have been in it. Um, and then from then went almost every single year. And then in my teens, when I think I hit like 16, I saw Blackfish and didn't affect how I felt about SeaWorld, but I thought it was a really good documentary and I thought it brought up good points. It did end up planting a seed for me to leave or not to leave, <laughs> to not support and so I did kind of flip between being pro and anti-cap for a few years. Um, my last SeaWorld trip was in December of 2019, actually. Um, and I have a lot of footage from that. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a very, I guess, tumultuous relationship with the park. Yeah. Because I, I hopped back and forth so much between what I thought. I laugh a little bit because I can relate a lot to that. <laughs> I grew up in Florida. I grew up in Orlando my entire life, basically. I was born in DC, but I moved to Florida at six months of age. Um, and my house is like maybe 10, 15 minutes from SeaWorld. I live super close. It's same as you kind of was just like, in Florida, especially the theme parks. If you live in Florida, there's like state pass holders, that yeah. like you get a discounted price and they do like pay for a day, come back all year kind of stuff. Um, and I remember like my mom, when we were really little, she would have like play dates for us, like at SeaWorld. Like even when we were in strollers and didn't even understand what any of it was, her and her mom friends would go walk around SeaWorld with us all in our strollers <laughs> because it was like they paid however much and then they could go the rest of the year, yeah. you know? So um from a really really young age 
I love SeaWorld. That was what I wanted to do every single year for my birthday. I wanted to go to SeaWorld. I wasn't like you where I necessarily had this like super deep connection to the orcas in particular, but I definitely from a really young age was like, I want to become marine biologist so I can become a SeaWorld trainer. Yeah. Like, that was the ultimate goal for a really, really long time. And kind of same as you, um, when the documentary initially came out in 2013, I was still pretty like pro SeaWorld. <laughs> like, yeah. It came out and I specifically remember like defending SeaWorld to my friends after they had seen Blackfish and had suddenly like turned on SeaWorld kind of thing. Um, And I, I, I just really loved the parks for a really long time and I couldn't see anything wrong with it. I honestly like even through college still really supported the parks. I definitely didn't used to have the same views on captivity that I do now. I think I've become a lot more educated and honestly, a lot of that didn't really start changing until I started coming out here to Oahu and started working with people in relation to One Ocean and meeting people like you and Natalie, who had just honestly a lot more education about it than I did. One of my assignments, like my freshman year, was to write a research paper. And we were able to choose whatever um, topic we wanted. And so I chose to write my research paper on Blackfish and go through everything that was true and false and try and be as like nonpartisan as possible, but ultimately even trying to write that very like straightforward documentary, I still definitely was a li- like, there was a pre, like a pro SeaWorld tone underneath it for mm-hmm. sure. Um, So it's just been really interesting, especially for me, like as I've become more educated and as I've changed my views just on captivity in general, yeah, sort of same as you, like kind of that tumultuous relationship with the park and that it still holds a really special place in my life, if that makes sense. Um, But it's definitely not, I don't hold it on this like high horse the same way that I used to. Up until honestly, pretty recently, I stopped going to the parks. Yeah. I mean, I went 2019 and I was even, I was like anti at the time, but I was kind of, it's so hard for me not to go sometimes because like my family will sometimes just get passes anyway, because my niece loves like parks like that and they go to San Diego. And so when my family goes, they usually just get passes because it's honestly like, well, it's pay for a day, come back all year. So it's yeah, it costs the same. So they're like, yeah, we'll get it. Cause if we just come to San Diego again, obviously COVID we, they haven't gotten it this year. Different, yeah. So usually they have a pass mm-hmm. and you can bring someone in when you have an annual pass. Um, and so I usually will go. Um, and yeah, I mean, 2019, I that was like two years ago. I mean, I've written about it a lot just on my blog and on my website, just like my views. And you've kind of discussed, we've had this conversation like off camera a lot. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I've kind of come to the point where there are certain species that I don't think can be in captivity. And I, like, I'm not a hundred percent anti-cap, not a hundred percent pro-cap. No. I think it's very nuanced and that it's, there's this kind of gray area because certain species I don't think at all should be in captivity. And then there's others that I'm like, eh, it's probably not that big of a deal. Um, orcas definitely fall under that category of animals that I don't think should be in captivity. Yeah. But that's honestly like, just as I become more educated, something that's changed in my viewpoint, you know, like that's not something that I believed off the bat. I'm going to kind of let you on this one really take the reins because you obviously have a much um, like broader education on this information. Um, So I'll be here to kind of interject and add add opinion and stuff that I know here and there. But um, if you want to kind of start, I guess the biggest thing is like maybe we kind of start just talking about like just the history of captivity, I guess, in general? Yes. So 
Um, the first killer whale that was like technically captured was named Wanda and it was in 1961, I want to say. So it was in the 60s and it really did originate um, in North America, um, sadly, a lot of times. It's weird that like it started here, but a lot of people don't think about captivity starting in the Pacific Northwest because we think about how they turned to Iceland afterwards and now Russia still does captures. 1960s, they first captured um, Wanda and then there was like Namu, a bunch of other whales. Um, and that's when sea parks kind of started to pop up. There was Sealand of the Pacific, which is talked about in um, the documentary. But SeaWorld San Diego and other SeaWorld parks also open. And a book I recommend to learn about the Pacific Northwest cap captures is Puget Sound Whales for Sale. Um, it goes really, it's by Sandra Pollard. Um, it goes really into depth about each of these captures and just how catastrophic they were to the populations out here. For example, um, the Southern Residents is one of those populations. They were caught um, pretty heavily. Um, there is like the infamous Pen Cove captures that happened um, over near Whitby in Washington. And I have some of the statistics of it. I mean, it's it like, takes just a lot of genetic diversity out of the population just in general, you know, mm -hmm. like you're taking and that, that's, that's the main potential issue. breeders basically out of the population. Yeah. And I mean, and, they kind of talk about it in the documentary too, how it was seen as like, we were like sea cowboys, you know, like yeah. it was this almost fun thing in a way, like, and obviously the person that testament that submitted testimony about um, his experience as one of those captors feels very remorseful about it now, or at least appeared to in the documentary. Um, yeah. But at the time, and even, even he says it, he's like, it was kind of like, I didn't realize what I was doing even until after I heard like the rest of that pod calling out for their baby that we had just taken kind of thing. Yeah. And so through that between, so 45 Southern resident killer whales were captured and delivered to marine parks between 1965 and 1973. 1970 is like the well-known um, infamous Pen Cove capture. Their population has never fully recovered and we can't credit that this is what gave them a demise um, because there are so many other factors that right. are leading to their problem. But yeah, it, it decreased their genetic diversity if nothing it, um, it just probably didn't help it didn't and one thing we, we we see now with the southern residents is there have been two males um since the 90s primarily that have fathered at least half of the calves and so what that does is when there isn't a lot of genetic diversity if like someone gets sick and everyone has a similar gene and it knocks them out you know they're all innately weakened to that that illness or whatever right. and that's the fear um now 53 total Southern residents were taken between 1965 and 1986. 13 were known killed during that time. Um, and they kind of talk about how they'd take the babies. Is that out of the 53 or that's an addition to the 53? It's separate. Okay. Um, or maybe it's part of it. I don't remember. I'm looking at this. Um, so there, or so it's a lot. I didn't even it's realize. A lot. I mean, I guess well, and their population was estimated to be at 120 before the captures. So 53, that's about about 50% of their population, was mm -hmm. estimated, which is pretty insane. I think yeah. too, at least for me, obviously, when you think about how many parks there are out there in the US, let alone outside of the US, there's obviously like a lot of whales in captivity. Yes. At least 53, you know, but, yeah. I, but that number is so when you when you say that number like 53 were taken from that population i don't know why that just seems like a lot <laughs> like it is and that's like just the number. southern residents they also took from the northern residents um and the other killer pop populations in that area um before they moved to iceland to capture because it ended up getting banned right in the US and they kind of talk about Canada. that in the documentary um like 1976 ish is when they yeah. basically passed that bill and there was a big push from SeaWorld to not ban that to the point where they actually during shows would stop the show or whatever. And the trainer would basically say that the U.S. is trying to ban um, us being able to collect 
killer whales. That this hurts us as a park. And they would give people pre-stamped letters and envelopes to send to say they don't support the banning of this. Um, That's pretty gnarly. <laughs> I, f- I learned this in August of this year, or like, I guess 2020. And I was mad. I was like, are you kidding me? It's just I mean, like, to be fair, it was a long time ago. It was. And it's it, like people had a very... <laughs> And to the point like that the documentary made, we didn't know that much about orcas at the time. It was kind of, I mean, they even like sort of, it. there was like this parallel almost to like sharks in a way. Yeah. Um, like they were showing clips of the movie like Orca and <laughs> which like kind of parallels Jaws almost in a way where it's like yeah. oh, big scary well, there was... like, black monster of the sea kind of thing. Yeah. There was some like, I don't want to say there's benefits to the captures, but we did end up, this is when um, people did start to kind of study killer whales. Mm -hmm. This is when the ID programs for transients, the bigs whales, um, and the southern residents did start up. So now we can look back and we can kind of start to look um, at the images that we have of the captures um, and start to like kind of ID individuals. That's how we know um, Lolita or Tokate. She is a member of LPOD. She now lives at Miami Seaquarium. She is like 100% Southern resident. She was taken from this Pen Cove capture in 1970 and we have pictures of it. Um, and we know who her family is in the wild now. Um, so there was stuff like we did kind of start to learn about yeah, and whales. When I wrote that paper, when I was back in college too, that was kind of one of the big points that I did make because SeaWorld has published some research related stuff. Um, I think the struggle as now being a researcher myself and understanding a little bit more about that process um, is you're studying a captive population that's not necessarily going to exhibit the same behaviors or just the same tendencies that a wild population would. They are either about captives that only apply to captive killer whales or they're Mm -hmm. about captive whales that you can't really apply everything to wild whales. Now there are things like we can kind of credit they helped with um one is for a long time we struggled to tell like if a female was pregnant one we didn't have drones to really right an aerial image the technology that we have now makes a lot of research so much easier yeah and so there is like we could have figured that out but they did help with the measurements of their females being like oh this is like how big they might get um and using that when you're looking at a wild whale and watching kind of like their body size that is one that in the parks they will they will talk about that they helped do that. Again, you can kind of be like, oh well, I think we could have figured that out on our own. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the hard part. But I think too, like you're looking for a reason to justify it in a way in your own yeah. mind. You know, yeah. like as someone that works there, I'm sure you're looking for whatever. Because I, I truly believe that nobody that works at SeaWorld, at least as trainers and stuff is maliciously like keeping oh, whales. Well, yes. You know what I mean? I, like they, they genuinely yeah. care about the animals. Um, and so I th- I'm sure there's some degree of convincing yourself that like what the organization you work for is doing is good and all that kind of stuff. Um, when it's kind of, it's like when, you, when you're there and like you're watching kids fall in love with an animal, they do share a lot of knowledge in shows now. And they know a lot about, yeah, t- like training a killer whale. Mm-hmm. Um, but you also are like seeing kids fall in love and like ask questions like that. Also, I'd be like, that's worth it. Like, what about what if those kids were me and you and we went on to do marine, right. like marine science? For sure. Um and I mean, that's a whole conversation we can have just about captivity in general, about like yeah. how there's really good benefits to it as well as not so good benefits or not so great things about it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but yeah, so I guess just like historically, obviously, and they talk about it in the documentary is that there wasn't, people didn't have the same sentiment towards orcas or just even honestly the ocean, I feel like that people do now. And part of that came because we didn't understand it all that much. Yeah. Um, and we've learned so much about animals in the wild as well as in captivity at this point um yeah but it's definitely it's interesting to hear kind of that historical perspective because I think people a lot of times assume that oh they knew it was this horrible thing right off the bat and quite honestly I mean obviously we weren't there we can't speak to that but I'm sure at the time it they didn't understand how intelligent and how 
human-like, you know, situations yeah. can really be. Um, and we've learned a lot just since then that's kind of given us a better perspective of like, hmm, maybe this isn't the greatest thing. <laughs> Let's just talk a little bit, I guess, about Tilly because he is kind of the focus of this documentary, um, yes. especially because he was the whale that um, eventually had the incident with Dawn. But I guess just kind of... Um, just like where he came from, how he ended up at SeaWorld, that sort of thing. Yeah. So he was caught in 1983 in Iceland. So he's an Atlantic killer whale from the Atlantic Ocean. He was two years old. They say, I think he was 11 and a half feet long. He's a big boy. And he was taken to Sealand, the Pacific in Victoria, Canada. Okay. So he was two years old and he arrived. There were already two other females at the park, Nutka 4 and Haida. Um, This was Tilukum when he first arrived. I don't even know if you'll be able to see this. Ah! I can always pop it up on the screen too. He's covered in white. They would cover them in this, um, what is it called? It starts with an eye. This chemical essentially um, that helped... I think with like stress and keeping sun off them and whatnot. Weird. Basically he came and he's like coating this white stuff. So it looks really weird. Um, but yeah, he lived there in for, you know, a long time. They talk about in the documentary how, you know, the two females that were with him, they were, they are more dominant because they are. Um, well, it's a matriarchal society anyway, right? So yeah. Females so, in the wild would be more dominant than. Yeah. In be. comes this random little, little man. Do um, we know so, um, were the two females that were in the pen were they captured prior to when things had to move to iceland like were they were they were they southern resident or northern resident whales i am pretty sure that they were we know this now but orcas have different dialects even between pods in the same area let alone basically on other sides of the planet so i imagine even even despite the fact that females are naturally more dominant tilly may not have even been able to communicate with them in any sense at all for people that don't know um do you want to just really quickly touch on the difference between a resident and a transient orca yes so um one of the main differences is going to be their diets so um but in general residents are whales that we will um that generally will stay more inland we see more regularly um and they are usually fish eating animals whereas transients or bigs killer whales as they are here in the Salish Sea. They are mammal eating. Um, They traverse generally bigger differences. They'll kind of go out into the open ocean a bit more. And we don't fully know where the Southern residents go when we don't see them, but transients, um, they're transient kind of as the name implies. Um, And so that the biggest difference is they look different as well. Mm -hmm. So they have physical differences between. um, Well, even between pods. Even between pods, but like their fins. I believe transients have a more pointed dorsal, whereas residents will kind of have more curved. It's one or the other. I'm really, but basically that that's one of the differences. Different appearances. Yeah. And I'll pop some pictures up here too. So you guys. Residents will have open saddle patches more, um, whereas transients won't. Their saddle patches will be closed. Not all residents have an open saddle patch, but they are the ones that do have at least a little opening. Um, So like there's physical differences. Um. But yeah, diet's kind of like the biggest one people will say. Right, oh, and that's eating. normally what I tell people when they ask about them just yeah. on tour and stuff like that because there is a transient pod in the Hawaiian Islands. Yeah. Very rare to see them, but they are here. Yeah. Um, so completely different population, different ocean. I mean, even Haida and Nuka could have been from different populations. If they were both residents, that does mean they were able to um, conversate you know, mm-hmm. with each other, yeah. at least a little bit. Understand each other. Yeah. And each pod has different um, dialects, but all together, the Southern residents do share like one common understanding. Um, and even if they were at least like a transient to a resident, mm-hmm. they would know the calls because they would hear each other. They would hear them. Right. Yeah. You'd be like, okay, like they could at least I don't recognize. Know. Yeah. Like, I don't know you from my mother, but like, I know that you're I've heard your calls before. Well, it's probably, I mean, I could, I guess you could compare it almost to 
like here in the US, if you speak English, everyone speaks English, but depending on what region of the US you live in, you may use different terms like soda yeah. versus pop or slippers versus flip flops, you know? Yeah. So same, so, I'm sure it's kind of that idea with the Southern residents, but given the fact that Tillicum is all the way from the Atlantic, a completely different ocean, a completely, completely different, different side of the planet, there probably wasn't able to even have that recognition, at least that we know of. Yeah, so that, that is one thing. And there have been different aggression issues in captivity that we have kind of um, learned about. Cited they touch that, on it on the doc- in the documentary as well. Yeah, that an issue of probably being able to um, displace either authority or whatever kind of caused the aggression to build up. Um, like when, when there's a little kid and they don't really understand what you're saying, you can kind of right. get more frustrated. So there, yeah, there's kind of sure. like that, that implication that that happens. Um, but he is also a boy. So when he comes in, he's immediately less dominant and he's getting beat up on. And they say that, that he was just covered in rakes, which is, that happens to a lot of males in captivity, um, at there all of the parks. There is some degree of raking that occurs in the wild as well, right? Yes. But it's Raking not necessarily does to the same level. I yeah. Guess and that's one thing. And there's pictures of, of whales that do have like really bad raking in the wild. Like, of course it happens. Um, it is generally. But they're not stuck less, in a enclosed yeah. location where they can't escape that. And it's location. generally probably not repetitive. It's um, not like by someone time. that isn't your mom or family. Well, it's kind of like, um, I'm sure in the wild, it's more akin to being scolded yeah even play like bottlenose dolphins will have rakes on i actually got asked this a lot on tiktok when i shared pic um videos of the bottlenose dolphin Mm -hmm. from kona like why are they covered in rakes and it's like it happens play scolding like they have teeth we have nails like you'd scratch your sister when you're playing with her like when you're playing and you have a mouth and that's kind of all you have to play with you're gonna scratch someone right and their skin is pretty tough like we don't like you don't know how much it hurts yeah. um sometimes they'll have rakes in the wild from what we are believing is helping moms give birth so one of those was j50 scarlet she she's passed now sadly um but she was like covered in rakes when she was a baby um and there is a belief that this was because they they helped kind of like pull her, pull out. her out that's kind of mm-hmm. cool and there's another um calf he's seen around his name is I don't know how to say his name but he's kind of like he's a more white gray color he also has scrapes and rakings Mm -hmm. and it's again believed that they might have helped pull him out that's cool I mean we don't have a whole lot of especially with the southern residents we don't have necessarily a whole lot of footage of them actually giving birth correct yeah no we don't I mean yeah the raking obviously in Tillicum's case was it was more not, extreme. Yeah, it was definitely. It was great. little and like you don't know these people <laughs> or these whales, you know. Um, you're not really necessarily doing anything wrong, and yet at the time they were punishing um, with their training, so that definitely didn't help. That if the female yeah, I wrote did that down, like the right, negative, the negative, and the male didn't, that they're then she doesn't get a reward. So yeah, I'd get pissed too, and I would probably take it out on you, especially so if that is the like negative reinforcement is one thing, but when you're pairing an animal with another and the negative reinforcement affects both of them, Mm -hmm. it kind of almost reinforces that aggression toward the- If that's going to get him to act right faster, she's going to do it. So like that definitely didn't help. And so, you know, they cover that. And then in 1991, that is when the Kelty burn incident occurs. And this is one of my issues with the documentary because there's many reasons. (laughs) But the women that they talked to did not officially assist with the um, investigation. Investigation. They were not. Well, they kind. I mean, they also kind of talk. They almost even admit to that mm-hmm. in the documentary. They're like, nobody talked to us afterwards. I'm like, then why are you? And then you clearly really, didn't. Like, I don't know. I think they were asking probing questions, and this is why. the The one lady says it was the one with the flopped fin. But here's it's, the thing. All three of them had flopped fins. And so that, and I sent pictures, pictures will pop up. Haida, Nutka, and Tilly all had a flopped fin. Now, Tilly's was a different direction, mm-hmm. but, but I definitely don't, yeah, 
I don't and think unless so. these women were as crazy as like we were and could know all the orcas by name, then they don't. Yeah. And so, and that's where that, that I have an issue with that because one, that kind of discredits and they definitely frame it in a way that it was Tilly that instigated it. The other two weren't involved. Other eyewitness reports contradict that, that there were multiple whales joining in. And the fact that he was less dominant, I believe would play an impact that he probably wasn't the one instigating. He may have joined in. There was talk that it looked more playful and like, you know, a whale play, you know, there's a lot of conflicting reports and ideas, but the fact he was less dominant and they all had flopped fins, Mm -hmm. it's really hard to say he did it. Obviously he was probably a part of it. I was really unclear when it, for the Kelty Burns incident, did Sealand it wasn't like SeaWorld, though, where they put trainers consistently in the water, was it? Yeah, no, it wasn't. Um, so, it was much shallower. It wasn't. I think that they would kind of get in and do swim around, like ride arounds, but it wasn't mm. like com- like crazy aerial waterworks. Right, right. Yeah. I just so, couldn't even, it wasn't very clear even in the documentary, like how much time, like they actually, like it wasn't clear whether she was like taken off the side of the swim step kind of thing or if she was already in the water like they didn't ex- explain yeah. it very much which is yeah. fine but yeah. the women had said like oh her foot slipped in and then they somewhat like they grabbed it the one with the flopped fin he did it mm-hmm. um but again that could have been any of them um and if they weren't like super involved in waterworks that could also like lead to them like being like oh a foot and grabbing yeah, so there's, I think there's it, a lot I of mean, things it's interesting to me this sort of dynamic where you already knew that these whales had issues with each other so it doesn't seem like maybe the safest or the yeah. smartest idea to insert I mean taking it back to just like our experience with sharks, if we see two sharks heavily competing with each other, I'm not going to all of a sudden decide that I want to be in the middle of that. Yeah. Well, and that's something SeaWorld does end up adopting separating whales completely. Mm -hmm. Um, And they talk about that, how that could have affected Tilly even more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of those was, well, Tilly was kept isolated even kind of before he killed Don. Um, But in San Diego, for example, Ulysses and Corky are two whales that just, Ulysses, he will go after her. They will not put them together in shows. They are always in separate tanks. It's in their profiles that they are not allowed to be gated within an enclosure together because Ulysses just goes for her. Mm -hmm. Um, Corky does not. She's really peaceful and amazing. Um, But that is one thing that (laughs) they keep those two away from each other. Um, I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, not everybody gets along with everyone. Yeah. Not dogs, not people, not or you know like it, yeah and that's and they they do learn that and they do end up adopting that but obviously like sealing the pacific was super small um yeah. he they couldn't really not keep him with someone yeah i mean the facility in itself and that's and that was a huge thing that when i initially wrote my paper about sea world sort of talking about i guess like what was true what was false sort of thing is that they were mentioning things like Sealand of the Pacific and Laura Parque, who clearly were not held to the same high standards that SeaWorld yes. was. Yet they were kind of like, I mean, Laura Parque is obviously a different situation given SeaWorld's connection to them, but yeah. at least for like Sealand of the Pacific, it was really interesting because they were sort of almost like, redirecting the frustration that sea land of the pacific like the bad things that sea land had done bad but you know whatever yeah, it was the, the, they were sort of the almost tiny night pen. Yeah. they were trying to redirect the frustration the audience felt with that situation almost towards sea world but it wasn't them sense. they weren't but it wasn't them and they weren't i mean seattle aquarium it. did that they had killer whales in really shallow awful tank like that happened yeah. in washington like um, but yeah, right. Sea World. So I think the different. documentary was very like, um, very propaganda like mm-hmm. in that sense, in that they clearly had a target enemy for the film in yeah. Sea World, but they were using sort of evidence from other parks. And obviously, Tilly, his history plays a role in who he is as an animal. 
And so you kind of do have to discuss his time at Sealand. But to me, it was very interesting, at least initially watching the documentary. I didn't feel that as much watching it again. I had I haven't seen the film in a really long time. So rewatching it the other day was the first time I had really rewatched it in a while. Yeah. Um, and I didn't feel as much of that sentiment, but it is very much kind of like pulling these like emotions that you feel towards Sealand, especially, and sort of trying to like lay that emotion onto SeaWorld. Yeah. Um, not to say that it's not deserved as well, but it's one of those things where um, it's very clear that Sealand is a much worse off facility just in general. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the Kelty Burn incident, he goes, he goes to Orlando. They talk about the, how he like lunged at a trainer and they cut the footage. There's no proof for that besides yeah. like the word of mouth. I did People find will that. will say it's a lie. I'm I, like, I kept waiting because I could, because I hadn't seen it in so long. I kept waiting. I was like, are they going to show this cut footage that like, they, they or whatever. Um, and yeah, to your point, like there's no evidence. It's hard to say. Like, do it's, I yeah, doubt that to, it could have happened? Not yeah. really, but. It's really by word. Whereas he said, they said, like some people say it happened. People will say they're lying. But on his summary, they do talk about that he has a tendency to pull. You can see it on his trainer profile, which I'm they looking at right now. They talk about that in the film as well, about, yeah. like, they show his thing and they basically yeah. straight up say it. Yeah. So, and on top of that, if you look at his trainer profile, um, they, they put down what things he finds adversive, um, or adversive, I can't speak, mm-hmm. adversive. <laughs> One of those things is repetition during learning with repetitive and correct responses, which is kind of what happens with Don at the end. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing is prolonged social access to other whales. He did not really like being with other animals. Um, He did like being with calves. He was known to be very sweet towards calves. One of those um, was Taima. He was very close to Taima, who was another whale at the park. Was it Um, up until they reached a certain size or age then? I think him and Taima were close forever. I think he had issues just from the get-go with the older females. I know, right. I think Katina is, was one. Make, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, and his experience from before, but he was always really good with calves. Um, I think he was close with, I know Taima, I think Malia was another one. He was close with Malia. Mm-hmm. Um, he has fathered 12 calves. Um, That's insane. Taima was, um, he did like, yeah, they were really close. He was close with her she had a calf at one point and he was in the same tank with both of them so yeah he and he was known like they all said his like the character traits they kind of describe him was like he was trusted he was mostly well behaved um he was sweet besides like of course like he's lashed out like he had some recorded incidents yeah I Um, mean I don't know it's so hard and they talk about this in the film about how intelligent they are and how emotional they are and all of that and I think at the time, t- up until a certain point, we maybe didn't understand that as well. I think yeah. for a while now, we have understood that they are extremely intelligent. Um, but I mean, you, it, it, you think about like people that get put in isolation, it's the same, you know, like if you're only able to see so many people ever, like that ha- as a social animal, that back. does something to your psyche. Yeah. Um. And one thing that has been like uh, the, a lot of pros, not a lot, but some people will say in the film, Ken Balcom like says he was in the psychosis and all that stuff is that, oh, it's anthropomorphizing like him. And it kind of is. It kind of is. And like, that's, I think that's a fair criticism because a lot of times Human aunties, to, aunties yeah. will, will criticize pros for saying oh, like they're happy. That's anthropomorphizing as well. Like we all from both sides tend to just put on human emotions yeah, on these I animals mean, it's, it's i think it's unavoidable it's unavo- yeah even in science and it's, it's like, fair it's unavoidable yeah and but there are some things like like we can kind of infer maybe not necessarily like oh he's isolated but he was abused let's say for a long time by strangers by people he by not by people <laughs> he was kidnapped by, <laughs> yeah he was kidnapped he was put in a tank with like these strange women I'm just sorry and they raked him and then he was switched again and then there were more women and they also raked him and like he's just this big guy um 
and he was really gentle with calves and with some of the um, he clearly isn't just a flat out monster no not at all like they loved him like uh, most of the trainers would always be like he is so sweet they loved working with him i like went to the park and knew tilly basically yeah it seems like in a way like i didn't i obviously didn't know him the same way the trainers do but i grew up seeing tillicum he was like my favorite whale at the park (laughs) And and one thing that I was interesting in John Hargrove's book, he, he was really good friends with um, Don's best friend who in this chapter, oh my goodness, it's like one of the last chapters in the book, heartbreaking. She is the one that was able to get Tillicum to cooperate and let her go, give the body. And it was her best friend and a whale that she was also really close with. And it, she was like, it was super hard because like, you don't want, how do you get mad? But then He also says a lot of trainers were mad at him and it like they can't like obviously they're not like hitting him because you know but that he some trainers like held a resentment their friend died and it was like graphic that they kind of like shunned him for a bit he was kept isolated i I think people were scared which is fair enough you know yeah and yeah i mean i think my dad my dad when the movie first came out it's a quote that I'll never forget. <laughs> like, and he goes, they're called killer whales, not sea ponies. <laughs> like, <laughs> kind of thing. And I think for me, one of my bigger arguments, at least when the documentary first came out, um, not obviously knowing and being as educated as I am today, but even just from my experience, like working with sharks, I think I, I, I genuinely think that every trainer understood that they're killer whales. Yeah. I know that there is testimony in the film that they withheld like footage of the accidents and things from trainers when they were applying and things like that, which I definitely think is maybe something that they should have shown them as like, Hey, heads up, like as a reminder, because we see it in the shark world when people don't, see how capable the animals are and they assume that they are you know puppy dogs and not apex predators yeah. we see it Same all the with- time right like we see it all the time in the shark world and i'm sure it's even easier with cetaceans that because love, of this. that love humans to believe that fact that well, they- and and because the claim that is brought up in the movie that they have never been recorded harming someone in the wild which is a lie <laughs> and it may not, not not necessarily a lie it may be that they weren't aware of this of, that there is um there's one recorded incident where it a uh, surfer was bit um and then there have been other things where like oh they will like attack boats recently in yeah. spain that's kind of a big issue um they will kind of go for people and there's even footage of the new zealand orcas now like kind of going near swimmers and like looking there's one where they are kind of like they don't bite but kind of looks like they're kind of yeah and it's i've seen it it could happen that's the thing yeah killer whales aren't really documented like like, killing someone but we for all we know one even a playful bite could be the end of a human being yeah Yeah. it can happen and just because we and like same with bottlenose bottlenose are recorded for attacking Mm. people (laughs) But, you know, there's I'm way more scared of bottlenose smart. dolphins oh. than I am of sharks. <laughs> I, I may have freaked out my mom when we went to Hawaii when I was like, oh yeah, like, like heads up, they're evil. <laughs> dolphins, like they're so smart and they are recorded to. I always tell people, I mean, get in there. because we've realized that cetaceans are so incredibly intelligent, the same way that almost humans are. I always tell people, I'm like, there are evil people in the world doesn't mean that everyone is but that comes with being really intelligent i believe yeah. you know there could like, be just some just malintentioned dolphin out there that's just yeah, like causing I mean, a ruckus yeah you know but we but, haven't met him because he's pelagic yeah you know? but and that's it, the thing is like but it's easy and they talk about this in the documentary they don't want to admit that those things have been happening because it that doesn't sell stuffed animals and that doesn't sell the the dream you know of yeah. when i think that these wild animals it's it's at the fault of 
I I don't love Blackfish. I don't hate it. I think it's a, a decent film. But one I mean, one thing is there's better documentaries that, out there, and I'm sure we'll yes. eventually watch them. Yeah, but like that is one thing where I'm like, yeah. I mean, one maybe they genuinely didn't know about this surfer incident. A lot of people don't. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't, you know, and don't want to say that. Oh, well, those boat I- incidents happened. The bumping, like all that, doesn't count. Yeah. I think it kind of does. Like the orcas kind of go after. It some shows boats. frustration. It, yeah, they get frustrated toward boats. Even out here, I've heard people talk about how in the Salish Sea that this has happened. And so, <laughs> and then you, one thing that could be brought up is other cetaceans have been recorded being aggressive towards people. Oh yeah. And that would imply if we were in the water, maybe more with orcas, it maybe could happen. more things would happen. Yeah. yeah. If an orca, if orcas were regular, really getting close like bottlenose are like spinners I mean, i've seen spinners get aggressive towards people in hawaii oh yeah because, like dart out and be like go away but you know we're like he said hi he want i interacted and i'm always like that's not yeah that's not what that is i mean i but, think i don't know i think one of the things that i mean we see it with sharks too but there's this fine line, I guess, of sort of building that stewardship Mm -hmm. to the ocean by showing that we can have a connection, that we can coexist with these animals. That they're not monsters. That they're not monsters. That they're not the puppy. (laughs) But there is this sort of um, almost like overcorrection that you see where people no longer respect the animal as a predator and just see it as that like puppy dog or that like yeah. loving that's my best friend you know but that yeah both are wrong and both can have an adverse effect on the animal but also for people like people are like oh sharks yeah. are so friendly and a shark is like approaching yeah I th- and whatever. i think to my point i think the trainers maybe because they weren't shown the clips of those attack situations or bad incidents or whatever it is maybe they didn't fully understand, but I find it really hard to believe that people that worked with those whales every single day didn't at least understand how capable that they were. Yeah. That's one thing. Like I had no idea, but it's like, I don't know. I remember things being on the news. Like I, I clearly have so much sympathy for the incidents that did happen and the people that were involved in that and the trainers that then had to somehow rationalize staying or seeing like their best friend hurt kind of thing like that is heartbreaking and really unfortunate that it ever did have to happen um but I I I in in a way I'm like I truly believe like if Dawn was still here she would in some degree say well I knew they were orcas yeah like I'm yeah And it's not to say that like she would ever want that to happen or expected it to happen. But in the back of your mind, there has to be some degree of, as someone that's seen them launch you out of the water, (laughs) like you must understand that if nothing else, they're just very capable animals. Yeah. Well, like they could be aware, but just all the good experiences and clearly like relationships, relationship sessions, play sessions, like obviously I think probably more out of anything they are friendly and playful at least appearing and so that could kind of like you just forget more so than like and that's where I do think like you can purposely forget and be like oh yeah he's fine now he's better now he's better here he nothing's happened in two years yeah maybe it was just maybe it was just that place or that yeah environment yeah I could see that too he had just I do think if it is true that SeaWorld never did show those trainers, those incidents, I think that is to some degree fault on SeaWorld's end. Oh, for sure. I mean, if they're hiding it from trainers, I think it's definitely like, fault on SeaWorld. And, if nothing, and I, I just find it interesting because that's such a learning opportunity, like to make yeah. your trainers better in the end. But like this happened. Yeah, like be, be aware, confident. let's know. <laughs> And I do, they do talk about how like Dawn was really safety conscious and like all that kind of stuff. So it clearly shows that like it, it's, you know, it could have happened to anybody kind of thing. Yeah. There's a lot of 
trying to blame and discredit the trainers for sure in the film but none of that will ever negate the fact that what happened happened Mm -hmm. and that you can't erase what happened that's the thing like you can kind of be like oh they didn't work with telecom they can't talk about them which is true if you didn't work with him and a lot of times the trainers are really talking like they had closer they all worked with telecom and they didn't yeah um one of those was john hargrove um that and I think part of that could have been the documentary took footage out of context where they said, what do you know about Telecom? And they talked about Telecom. Right. And it kind of seemed like they were saying, oh, well, I worked with him. I worked with him, la, la, la. Yeah, I mean, editing is a powerful tool, you know? Mm-hmm. You can kind of... Which was the issue with, like, Mark Simmons. Put other places, you know? He was, but. yeah, he was a current employee at the park. Um, they, like, nuances could be taken out of context. Like, maybe when they were talking about the psychosis he could be like maybe before he said obviously like different in a human but and then this, says this the sentence and yeah and then yeah editing's a powerful tool and producers and editors and things like that will do what they can to make what you say fit their agenda you know what i mean yeah um you when hope we, that that's not the case and i'm sure nobody with <laughs> takes that intention you know going into it yeah. um but yeah so i i guess i mean I do have a question. Yes. Why are they all called Shamu? Like, obviously they all have their own <laughs> names. I always wondered this literally as a kid too, because I didn't, I, yeah. I mean, honestly, until I met you, I didn't even know that they had other names. Um, but <laughs> yeah, like, where did that come from? Shamu you know? is a stage name, but Shamu was a real whale at SeaWorld okay. um, early was on. Like the first or something? Technically Namu was the first. Okay. Um, then Namu, Shamu. Okay. And like, you know, she Namu is like kind of, I've it. seen a lot of things claimed about the, like, is it she like Namu? Like where it came from. Yeah. But Shamu basically was an, a whale earlier on and it became a stage name. So like the okay. Shamu show when Shamu was there. Yeah. Right. Um, and so then it carried on. They all just um, kind of became Shamu. Yeah. So Shamu was an actual whale. It became a stage okay. name. They no longer use the word Shamu. If you go to the parks, it's all, it's Orca Stadium, not Shamu Stadium. The Orca shop, not Shamu shop. Yeah, um, all that they they've taken it off probably because of the criticism. I feel like that's just okay, whatever. Yeah, it's I still call it Shamu Stadium. Like, yeah. I'm like, oh, Shamu, I'm going to Shamu Stadium. Oh, Orca Stadium. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was just the, the stage name. That okay, they that's what time. I figured. And like, it worked. Like Sham, like you'd yell Shamu, Shamu. Like, yeah, it it's it's something from a business perspective that makes it's marketing it's just easier yeah it was just a shamu yeah. i love shamu they claim in the movie that there were 70 plus reported incidents uh, that well in were never really yeah. like shared with the public and i'm sure some of them were way more minor some of them were way like more major clearly we're like laura well, Parque, things like that yeah. well so uh, yeah so the, i mean there's a lot of things i mean tilly like yeah there's he has the two other aggression incidents with mm-hmm. daniel duke and then don um but she, there's a lot to talk about those. <laughs> yeah. Um, but with um, aggression acts, I do have an interesting statistic. Okay. Um, out of 153 recorded incidents, so there's more than 70, 153 recorded, only 16 involved whales who were with their mothers at the or at the birth park and had never experienced a transfer. Every other aggression act or incident separated young was done by wild caught whales mother had either died or was they were separated from their mother or they had been transferred okay so there's a big correlation that you could take from that that either either coming from the wild anxiety yep that mother died so that'd be orchid orchid um her mom died they showed it in the film that or they're separated from their mother or that they are transferred to any degree that they tend to be the ones that are aggressors now there are the 16 who hadn't had any of that um but the major ones you can see that there's at least a big connection between the two. Yes. Um, and which is, yeah, the one, and especially the more aggressive whales, let's say orchid and shuka, for example, at San, San Diego have been moved, have been separated. Orchid's mom died right in front of her blood out to death when she was seven or 11 months old. Yeah. So they showed that death. footage. Correct yeah uh-huh. the full footage is worse they showed oh, the very um PG friendly part. yeah 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 and they do kind of talk about it in the film how even the trainers were very surprised 
that they made the decision knowing the social bonds that they had in the wild to separate babies from their mothers yes separations you find interesting because it I mean it happens in zoo and aquaria all the time transfers mm-hmm. happen all the time no matter the species um it's like almost like trading baseball cards <laughs> sometimes in a way um yeah. I, I it will is say really interesting that they chose to make that cognitive decision to separate young. The so only, the only thing I can think that it would be beneficial is to increase your genetic diversity in the breeding program. That is one of the main reasons they do it. But another one, so they, they bring up two in the film, Katina and Kalina. Kalina was four and a half. Um, that one was bad. I don't think, but then they bring up Kasaka and Takara. Now I love Kasaka. I grew up with Kasaka. Um, Here's that full, they take that one out of context. I find it funny that they actually bring up that story, but not Takara's separation from her calves, which are worse, but they bring it up because um, John Hargrove worked extensively with Takara. Takara is like his whale. Mm-hmm. Um, his book is dedicated to her. Um, he loves her. So that's why obviously they did the Takara and Kasaka story. But here's the thing. I'm going to talk about that because <laughs> this is one of the stories I actually have a big issue with in the film. Takara was 12 years old when she was separated from Kasaka and actually had a calf of her own. And the okay. reason that it's believed that she was separated is because she was causing a lot of issues at that park because Kasaka and Takara both are extremely dominant whales. Mm-hmm. And so is Orchid, who is also at that park. And there was a lot of issues with Takara kind of displacing a lot of animals, causing a lot of issues. And they wanted to genetically diversify other parks. And right. so they moved Takara and Takara has her own baby at this time. Um, and they move her to Orlando. She gives, and she was, I think she was also pregnant at the time with another baby, but anyway. So she good. goes to Orlando while she's in Orlando. She's with her calf Kohana. Kohana was the one that was with her in San Diego. Kasaka helped her give birth to Kohana. I have pictures that I sent you. Um, now she's in Orlando. She gives birth to Trua. Um, Trua is her little boy. When Kohana is three, she is taken with three other calves to Laurel Parque. That is the one I thought they should have flushed out as ho- big, bad, horrible. Because Kohana is only three years old. And here's what happens. Um, there's also a direct link when babies are taken from their mothers too young, they do not know how to mother and that increases calf death rates. So Kohana goes to Laurel Parque. They want to breed. Kohana has two calves, Adon and Victoria. She rejects both of them, never mothers them. Adon is still alive, but Victoria dies pretty young. They yeah. are basically well, hand just like- and mothered by trainers or trainers. Yeah. And then in 2009, Takara is sure. Moved- to those young mm-hmm. then not knowing how to mother because they were not it, mothered it becomes a bit yeah and so that's awful and that then hurts those two calves but on top of that so in 2006 Kohana's taken 2009 they moved to Kara from Orlando to Texas and they leave Trua so she doesn't have her son um so that's another separation that they take from her and then she now lives in, in um, Texas with two of her calves that she lives with forever now. <laughs> um, but she has two other calves that are ones in Spain, ones in Orlando. And those are separations. Obviously, John wasn't there for those ones, which I think mm-hmm. is why they don't bring them up. Right. They have him explain the one he was there to witness, which was Kasaka and Takara. Um, but the other two separations I thought were worse and also could bring in more to talk about, like yeah. the adverse effects of separation. Um, but I don't think Ohana had had calves at that point. Yeah. But those are things that. Well, too, I think the documentary is trying to focus more just on like the aggression side of things more so than like the separation anxiety things, which obviously can lead to that aggression, but the documentary is relatively short. They don't have time to go into all of those things. But the Kasaka Takara separation from the beginning, I would say with Takara displacing and being aggressive and she is a very dominant animal that moving her made sense. That was a move that they needed. I mean, ultimately, it's the safety of all the other animals. Yeah. And if she's causing a ruckus and all that, moving her um, and, you know, genetic diversity, they don't want interbreeding, which happens anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, and then Kasaka, she actually was also another whale that after the Ken Peters incident, 
became a no water works animal. You were not allowed to be in the water with her. So they did take a precaution finally. <laughs> um, but another thing about that attack that they in also the, don't explain. In the documentary, her, they almost make it seem like it's Tilly. You know, it's, it's Kasaka. Peters. No, it's, it's, it's Kasaka. That's at San Diego. Yeah. And there is a lot of belief. She knew full well she could disrupt that show to get with her baby. Kalia was under two years old and was separated from her in a different pool and you could hear her crying. And so a lot of people believe that what happened was she was not trying to kill him, but trying to get the show to stop. So they would just let her go with her baby. Yeah. Um, and that, and that's people say like, she's so smart. She knew what she was doing. She, he kind of had, he had some issue. Like he, I think they said he like broke his leg or foot. Well, I mean, he also handled that situation extremely well. Oh, yes. He was, that was a great example. And they even say of trainers knowing kind of how to react. Yeah. Being calm and just doing breathe ups. Like and getting like it together shows. and not mm-hmm. panicking kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know if I was in that situation, if I could handle it that way. This thing, and, 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 and to contrast, they talk about the splash in Orchid where they drag the the girl and she's like screaming for help yeah that's another one it's like ken peters just was really calm and i think maybe he was just really aware like uh, she's gonna pull me down i'm just gonna i'm gonna do my best to hold my my best like i'm trained to dive and hold my breath and they're also supposed to they're trained from the park as well right um very i think it was very good on his part and that was one that and well, even just from like a free diving perspective, if she was holding him down for like a minute, a minute and a half at a time, after you do that a few times, <laughs> that's not easy. No. And then they were smart with the net. Um, that was one that they even said it was like, they kind of handled that situation really well, but they also kept it down. And it was like, I, yeah. I don't know. But yeah, then the whole Dawn incident one issue is that don's family never gave permission for them to share the story which i do think is a little messed up a little messed up that they fully flush it and they and they do paint her in a really good light which is good but a lot of people are really vindictive towards trainers um and well i mean they talk about how in the court case sea world kind of tries to like put the blame a little bit more on Don. Yeah. Just to be, I mean, as a big conglomerate it makes sense that they would try and do that to save their own butt basically yeah, from them. Yeah. But yeah. it is sad to see that, that ha- like that they attempted to do that, you know? Yeah. And um, there was like, they're like, Oh, her ponytail, but they're desensitized. To, it's all that kind of, but um, one thing in the movie that they, don't correct and i i understand why they put it in because it's dramatic the her arm is gone no it's not and here's and and obviously like someone calling the police just sees blood and skin ripped off yeah. and it's like oh her arm's gone um and but they put it in in the end then they they're like oh they like let go of her arm they sound like, like she's like like her arm is inside of the whale yeah but and they've and they, i think they even say oh he swallowed it here's what happened i read her coroner's report um, and I've read it multiple times. So ultimately she died from trauma and drowning. Um, her arm wasn't ripped off, but it was avulsed, which based, I looked at pictures and I regret it because I hate gore. Um, basically the muscles ripped off of bone, muscle skin. And so I, like it, it was like looks, the soft tissue was gone. Soft tissue was gone. Her arm in the report does not say it was completely removed from her body, but that this it was avulsed. Mm-hmm. So it can kind of look like maybe it was. Yeah. Um, but they're like, he won't let go of her arm. He swallowed her arm. Maybe he swallowed like the meat or something. Yeah. Um, she had a severed spinal cord and then she was completely scalped, which they talk about. Um, but ultimately it was drowning and as well as the blunt force trauma, which like yeah. could have knocked her out, then she drowned. She's in so much pain. Yeah, and hopefully, her. hopefully that happened quickly for her. Yeah, but she didn't swallow the, he didn't swallow her arm. That yeah. was the biggest one because it's literally like the quote. It's like clearly arm. stated. A whale has eaten one of the trainers. He swallowed her arm. And I just wrote, no, <laughs> <laughs> because I was like, no, I get why. Like, obviously someone calling the police is like, he has her arm. Like, in, well, in and a they, panic and not yeah. knowing the situation for sure. Yeah. But um, it, they don't correct it. 
Yeah. That was my thing. I'm like, we have a coroner's report. It's public information. You can Google it. Yeah. They don't correct it. And that's my thing where I was yeah. like, as a documentary, I know why you do it, but like, it's a little shady for sure. And I'm kind of like, Hey, I think too, like, I don't know. I went to that program as a kid. Yeah. Like I ate breakfast with Tilly. Yeah. Dine machine. Yeah. Like, so and- it was a little eerie to like watch it and be like, yeah, I literally sat right there in that spot. Yeah. And that ugh, they're so it's sad. Yeah. But yeah, he didn't need her arm. And that was just my thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is interesting. Like as much as obviously what happened to Dawn is horrible and you would hope that that never happens to anyone. There clearly were a lot of incidents prior to what happened with Dawn and as awful as it is at least her situation brought about some change yeah and SeaWorld stopped doing waterworks that day and that day I remember when it being occurred, so upset the other about parks it. knew about it and everyone was pulled out of the water yeah so even before the OSHA case they were not putting trainers in the water right so they did take that at every and like they could have kept going at San Antonio and, and San, San Diego. Nothing happened there. But they pulled everywhere. Yeah. Part of that might have been PR at the moment. Um, but they got calls to the other stadiums that this was happening. Um, and it definitely changed how they work as an organization. And it did push them to start moving in a more educational route. Yeah. Like, so I mean, there's been a lot. I let's just talk really quickly, I guess, before we kind of wrap it up. But yeah a lot has changed. And I remember yes. as a kid, when I first heard about this sort of stuff happening, I was in, I guess I was in like maybe seventh or eighth grade when Dawn happened. But I remember being so upset that they pull, that trainers were no longer going to be in the water with the orcas. I remember oh, thinking, me too. it was, I remember being, I remember thinking one, I was like, now the animals have even less enrichment like but then (laughs) I also was like my dream of being an orca trainer is because I don't care Yeah, because you're not in the water because I don't want to not be in the water I was like well that's fine I'll just be a dolphin trainer because they can still swim with the dolphin I had the same my I literally thought the same thing which now I'm like oh and now I'm like wow I'm I'm like so Well, now knowing what I know, I'm like, oh gosh, like I was just so uneducated about everything. But at the time I was like, this is so sad that like, like accidents happen. I like my whole, my whole thing was accidents happen. Like, why are you punishing the whales and punishing the trainers for this single incident? Because I also just didn't know about everything else also. When some of the whales really did like waterworks and I bet it did it, it, was probably sad for them and I think that that that's one thing that a lot of people fail to acknowledge with shows with that they like they probably hated people being on top of them like a lot of the whales love being touched loved doing waterworks loved doing and like the train like Like John Hargrove at least willingly would willingly and John Hargrove talks about in his book there are some of the animals that are um higher energy orchid is one of those I really love orchid if you guys can't tell um (laughs) She is a high energy whale, loves like they, she's excited for shows, likes to be in shows, doing high energy, those complicated behaviors. Mm-hmm. Um, and when, and then Kalina, Kalina was one that really liked being touched and having interactions in the water, not even waterworks, but just like even just like trainers swimming with her yeah. and just like playing. Um, when that happened and just suddenly, It wasn't like they like eased out and just stopped doing really high water works, but would still like do relationships, relationship ship. I can't speak relationship sessions, like petting and being in the water. Everything was done. They weren't in the kayaks and because they used to like sit in kayaks and like go around in the tanks and like Mm -hmm. jump in and play. And, you know, um, everything stopped that it was probably like, what the heck just happened? Like my, my friends and that's part, like humans are part of their social groups at this point yeah at that point in captivity especially for the that. babies that grew up in that environment yeah and the, it's like where did you guys go like what happened it might have just been and obviously like they they you know you get over it <laughs> but like 
I'm sure at first some of the animals were like, what the heck? Like, well, it's just a very big change in routine, if nothing yeah. else. And now like babies are not used to it. They still do desensitize desensitization training where they will have a trainer in the water, but they are teaching basically the whales teaching to them ignore them. The people. <laughs> yeah, basically if someone falls in, like take babies like Kamiya, Makani, and Amaya have all been born since and never had people in the water with them. So say a trainer fell in, they might be like, oh my gosh, hi, and go up and like yeah. grab them. They will actually in med pools. So they're only eight feet deep and the floor mm-hmm. does rise. So if something happens, yeah. they can control the situation. Right. But they have them with a trainer and they have another trainer in the water, just like swimming around them. They'll go over them. They'll go under them and just mm-hmm. get them used just to having someone- to get them like desensitized yeah. to it basically which make and, and people be like they're still in the water like you'll see it makes sense though it's a safety those. thing yeah it's so like one of those babies has never experienced that that they could just be like excited and go yeah. grab right um so but i think that, some but, good things obviously that have come out of it are is like the ending of the breeding program yeah 2016 they stopped breeding but i mean that doesn't mean it didn't stop all around the world <laughs> yeah it didn't actually china has created a a park that is completely dedicated to breeding. They have seven to 10 whales, I think, at that park. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, captures- and that's a, a big thing that we've talked about, just the two of us too, is a lot of people argue that just let all the whales go. Oh my gosh. Like yeah. just, or, or just end your, end your orca program flat out kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, like we've talked about, it is still a money-making business. It's very possible that if SeaWorld closed down completely in order to try and cover their bottom line, they may try and sell their orcas to international organizations or international facilities. Yeah. I, there, there's the question of like, from a PR standpoint, would they, but technically San Antonio and Florida, California whales could not be sent to it's illegal, right? Another, it's illegal to move um, out of the country, mm-hmm. out of not the country, huh, state. But um, the Texas and, and Florida whales potentially could be sold to a different park. Right. And it's not to say that they would do that. Yeah. But it's, it's just but... something that, like if they really fell on hard times and they did not have somewhere else to go and they kind of know like, hey, we're falling on hard times because of the orcas. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously I think they'd get more flack for doing that, but there, it is a, it is a potential that could happen. Yeah. It's that it could be a C pen. Maybe they would partner with the whale sanctuary right. project, um, which would be a better option, you know? Yeah. I think people need to work with SeaWorld mm-hmm. for a better solution. Right. Or better I would agree. Environment. And I think, and like we've talked about, I'm not completely anti-captivity altogether. I still think that there are species that you can keep. And like, for me, I don't think that SeaWorld necessarily needs to close down completely. I think there are exhibits that they could potentially keep going and they have a great rescue program in Florida yeah. with manatees and sea turtles and things like that. Um, and I think truly we have the technology nowadays to create an experience that is just as impactful with cetaceans like dolphins and orcas and things like that that would still create that stewardship yeah I don't know if you've seen the robotic dolphin that was created I have I thought that was cool and yes it costs bajillions of dollars to create but that like discovery cove where you can swim with the dolphins I wouldn't have known any better (laughs) It looks so incredibly real. Yeah. And it's still something that you can teach them about behaviors and about that sort of thing. And I think that, or even like VR nowadays or this like projection technology that they have, there's so many ways that you could still have that orca dolphin experience. Obviously there's nothing that's gonna be the same as seeing the actual animal. Yeah. We can get so close to that nowadays combined with having those other species that are more suitable for captivity that don't migrate that aren't incredibly intelligent combining those two together I think that there's still a very valuable like way to keep that program alive but it just not be as harmful yeah well and one thing I 
So I, I don't advertise overnight. boycotts just because I, I, it makes me feel weird. I, and I, I like my platform being open for discussion. I know a mm-hmm. lot of people that are pro that follow me and I have friends that go to the parks and all that kind of stuff and which I'm fine with. And even I'm, I've also, I'm totally open to working with SeaWorld. I'm more for like working a middle ground, yeah. looking at tank expansion, um, looking at, yeah. Different looking at things that you can do all that kind yeah because yeah. yeah I really don't think they'll release into I think the reality of it is is that's just probably not going to happen I don't think that it's necessarily yeah I don't think I mean, they'll ever fall that hard that they would financially feel like they're forced to do it I yeah, think SeaWorld will stay well, they have plenty of people that still support them wholeheartedly exactly without reservation yeah know? so it's like they they still have an audience and a lot of sometimes a lot of their people are foreign as well like maybe the american attendance has dropped and it has um but san diego is tourist area florida oh is a tourist insane. area they will still have packed stadiums in the summers i've been there in a packed stadium um i really I mean, just, even with covid i know people that have gone since oh i know yeah and Yes, it's reduced capacity, but like, Big I don't parts. know how reduced, reduced capacity is a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. So, and there's other animals they take care of. And I, I also think that they get, um, they don't have, there's not enough attention sometimes on the dolphins, on the sea lions. Yeah. And on the rescue animals, they have rescue animals that are um, in shows. Yeah. And that they provide a home for. There's three pilot whales that have been rescued that are mm-hmm. in San Diego now, kind of a thing. Um, and that's why I don't think just closing the parks is helpful because their research, their rescue is important. For sure. Yeah. I mean, ultimately it's not the black and white issue that you would, an, it's, there's no easy answer, you yeah. know. They're not so. black and white like an orca, it's gray. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so that, I mean, I don't know if there's much else to really kind of talk about. I mean, obviously we're probably going to be discussing many, many different orca related documentaries and films in the future. I know we've got like free really free Willy is on the the list of ones to cover. If any of you guys watching have any suggestions of specific things that you want to hear us talk about, we're more than open to that sort of stuff, but please like talk about this in the comments, have a discussion with each other, with us, Bring up points we missed. Yeah, like if I was wrong, tell yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, like let's really have a discussion about um, this issue because, like we talked about, it's not a black and white yes or no answer. There's a lot of nuance to it, and so that's kind of why we wanted to discuss this documentary. Not only because it was such a impactful and popular documentary at the time, but also just because um, there's a lot that goes into it. So if you had to give this documentary like a number out of 10 what would you give it maybe like a six yeah I I I I always say seven that's and that's one thing is like I just don't think this I it's a good show but I don't think it should be hailed as like the end all be all yeah I it's very um one-sided and that's I think why I can't give it super high marks I the reason I even give it a six is because I think it led to a lot of really great things in the captivity like industry a lot of really good changes but and it brought a lot of awareness obviously this was an extremely popular documentary compared to some of the other ones that we might discuss but um there's a lot of fault in it too yeah they just leave they leave leave out so much it's it takes things out of context and that's where like in in good in good conscience i cannot just say watch this. Like, it's all you need to know. It is not all you need to know. (laughs) Please do more. (laughs) Yeah. But hopefully we'll be able to discuss some of those things that you should watch more of. Um, so until next time, I guess that was kind of just our reaction to blackfish. Um, if you guys want to open up the comments to conversation, please do. If you have suggestions of movies and documentaries you want us to discuss in the future, please let us know. Um, We got a couple requests um, to do 47 meters down. So we will probably be doing that one next week. So a little bit more more lighthearted than um, Blackfish this week. So tune in for that one. I feel like it'll like documentaries will always get more serious and then movies will be like, ha ha. Yeah. 
So Every we'll mess other- around a little bit more uh, next week with something that's a little bit more lighthearted and fun. But until then, we will see you guys in the next Marine Bio Movie Club. <laughs>